have a target that we have set for the 100th anniversary of our republic. We want to be rule of law with advanced democracy and an advanced uh, civil society. And the child-oriented policies are at the heart of our policies. We will uh, try to strengthen whatever work we're doing. Uh, we would like you to know that whatever uh, demand you will be putting on the table, we would not consider it as a pressure imposed on us. We consider this as a support. We consider this as guidance on our roadmap, because we are a government that tries to establish policies in a child-centered manner. We attach importance to those issues. Our government attaches great importance to this issue. The civil society, local administrations, local administ administrations are improving themselves every passing day uh, in terms of the rights of the child. We are a party in terms of the rights of the child. We are the advocates for the rights of the child. I would like to greet each one of you with respect, and I wish success for this meeting. It, it is very easy for us to share with you what we have done during the last decade, because many things had been achieved. This is the story of success, what we have achieved in 10 years. We're very much aware of our deficiencies, uh, of the things to be improved, but we need your support to improve in these areas as well. I wish success for your meeting with my best uh, regards and respects. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, for your presentation of the report and for very quickly giving us a very complete overview of the progress that you have made and the fact that you have openly mentioned the challenges that you still have before you. So I think what we can do is immediately move in this dialogue to a very open dialogue, and I do hope that our debate will be fruitful, useful for you, and for the better implementation of the rights of the child, and for improving the life of 29 million children in your country. I would then now give the floor to the colleagues on the committee, initially the two rapporteurs, Initially, Mr. Kotran has the floor, and then Mrs. Al Shehal. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Permettez-moi. Thank you very much, sir. First of all, allow me to extend a very warm welcome to the whole delegation of Turkey, and to thank Mrs. Fatma Shaheen, the Minister of Family and Social Policies for her introduction concentrating on access and dialogue. We thank her for her words and the member state for having sent such a very high level and numerous delegation headed by the minister. This will allow us a frank, open and constructive debate and to be, as you have said, Madam, to be the lawyers, the defenders of children in Turkey. May I congratulate the State Party of presenting its second and third periodic report and having replied to the list of issues this second and third report did come in with a certain delay. The initial report had been looked at by our committee in 2001, and so this now is 11 years ago. We should recall that this will also deal with the measures that the State Party has taken by way of follow-up to the concluding observations of our previous examination of the first report as well as the two protocols, one on the sale of children, which was before our committee in 2006. That's the protocol on the, conflict, the Convention on the Rights of Child, Sale of Children, Child Prostitution and Pornography, as well as our examination of the Children in Armed Conflict Optional Protocol, which was in 2009. There are 
many positive aspects that, of course, we would like to mention. The state party has mentioned this process of reform on the rights of children, which has been carried out by the state party. And I would just mention a few of them. For example, amending the anti-terrorism laws in 2010, which allows the children to appear before courts for minors, as well as a reduction in the sentences for children aged less than 18. And then the rehabilitation, education, care and social security for children with disabilities and that law from 2005. And then this afternoon we will be discussing the fact that the minimum age for criminal liability should be raised. Now, when we look at the principal international human rights instruments which have been adhered to by the state, my first question here would be whether Turkey intends to ratify the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons Against Enforced Disappearances, which is of 20 December 2006, and the optional protocol to our convention. This is the third optional protocol, which relates to the communication procedure, and the convention was adopted 19 December 2011. And I see that Turkey hasn't really ratified any of the optional protocols with other conventions where it's an issue of communications. For example, on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, they have not ratified that optional protocol. And the same applies to the, convention, the covenant on educational, social, and cultural rights. I do realize, of course, that these are called optional protocols, but Our most recent one with this convention is the 19th of December 2011, and I was wondering what your position was. So getting into the general measures, I would come back to the issue of reservations in the list, in the replies to the list of issues. The government says that it maintains its reservations as part of its sovereignty and have said that they have withdrawn reservations in CEDAW, and we do welcome this fact, Article 9, dealing with nationality, is something that our committee is very sensitive to. And in Turkey, this movement towards lifting or withdrawing reservations. We would hope that that would also apply in the case of this convention. In our previous concluding, concluding observations from 2001, we had included this, especially in the case of education and freedom of expression and the right to one's own culture, to use one's own language. These reservations would prejudice children of ethnic groups that are not recognized as minorities in particular, the 1923 Lausanne Treaty, especially with regard to Turkish children. So I was wondering whether you might be thinking of going further and withdrawing those reservations as well. And then I'd move on to the direct invocation or application of the convention in reading your report. We have seen and we welcome the constitutional guarantee which establishes the primacy for international instruments over national laws. We do, unfortunately, regret the fact that there is no direct invocation of the convention in the courts. And we were wondering whether to you have training courses for judges and lawyers, especially with regard to the justiciability of the rights of the children. 
and I'd very quickly move on to another point having to do with the private sector and the rights of the child. We share the concern expressed by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights with regard to the repercussions of the Ilisu Dam, which is under construction and others, on the exercise of economic, social and cultural rights in those regions. And here I'm thinking about forced expulsion and eviction and the proposed compensation proposed for those who will be displaced and the consequences for the environment and the culture. Then with regard to forced evictions in Istanbul where you, there are urban renewal projects, what has occurred in the follow-up to the concluding observations of the Committee of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This affects children and within the Roma community these expulsions, evictions and displacement have affected the children's schooling and the committee is concerned at the laws which apply to these projects in the cities and they don't seem to take into account the participation of interested parties and are not compatible with international standards. Votre réaction. And so we would like to hear the delegation's reaction to that, and in particular measures taken to put a stop to it. The next question uh, it pertains to the definition of the child. The committee takes note of the Turkish Civil Code, which establishes 17 years of age as the minimum age for marriage for girls and boys. And this gives effect to the preceding recommendation of the committee. Nevertheless, the age of 17 is, of course, below that of the age of 18. So we would like to know whether Turkey intends to amend the civil code so as to establish a minimum marriage age for girls and boys of 18 years of age. Before I give the floor to my colleagues, I would like to refer to another issue, which is non-discrimination and also the issue of torture. With regard to non-discrimination, first of all, the legal framework for the fight against discrimination, we take note of the legislative reforms that have been undertaken by the state party, as well as the activities uh, of the council in favor of equality and the fight against discrimination. But we are concerned by the lack of a legal framework which can be applied generally against issues of discrimination. So the question that the committee has is what measures have been taken or what measures are planned by the state party in order to adopt a, a general law on non-discrimination and particularly non-discrimination towards children. The next issue with regard to discrimination uh, towards minorities and given the fact that the state party has not recognized the minority status, has recognized the minority status only of Greeks, uh, the Jewish community and Armenians, the community is concerned by the lack of a larger legislative framework that will regulate uh, recognition of all my state minorities in the state party, including Kurds, the Roma and Arameans. That we are also concerned by the fact that these communities do not enjoy the rights that are, are accorded to other minorities. We would like to know about what measures the state party plans to take as well as action plans it plans to adopt in order to recognize children belonging to these, to all of the minor minorities in the country and to offer them f uh, all possibilities to enjoy all of their rights. I would like to conclude by referring to the discrepancies between some of the regions in the country, specifically between urban and rural areas in terms of the exercise of economic, social and cultural rights as recognized under the convention. We also note the, that there is a significant uh, level of poverty that impacts the population in the eastern part of the country. Finally, we would like to bring up the issue of corporal punishment and cruel and unusual pu punishment. We would like to know if any improvements have been made in the judicial system in that regard. 
the committee is concerned about the lack of legal guarantees to prevent the torture and ill treatment of children. And we also wish to express our concern with regard to some of the information that we have received, which indicates that children continue to be held uh, in establishments intended for adults. And we are also concerned by the fact that some of these children are subject to interrogations carried out by the specialized security services. And we would like to know whether those interrogations are we, we also note that those interrogations are often carried out without any legal assistance for the child or any guard, guardian or adult guardian or lawyer for the children. So we would like to know more about that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thank you. I now give the floor to our co-rapporteur, Madame Alshay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And also, I would like to uh, wel warmly welcome the distinguished delegate. Evet, ben de e, saygıdeğer delegasyon üyelerine hoş geldiniz demek istiyorum. Sayın Ekselansları açılış konuşmanızdan dolayı da. E, government's effort to promote and the government's effort to promote uh, children children in Turkey. Uh, first, I would like to start with a set of questions concerning the independent monitoring mechanism. Uh, an ombudsman law was submitted to Parliament and debated. And before the June 2011 general election, the law did not reach the floor. Can you update us on the legislation regarding the establishment of an ombudsman? What does the draft legislation propose exactly? And with the Child's Rights Monitoring Committee that was established in 2008, which serves as a central role with children's issue between Parliament and the key external actors such as children and civil society, what will be the respective role of the Parliamentary Committee on the Ombudsman and the Ombudsperson? And with regards to the new board that was established by a decree from a Prime Minister a few months ago, the Child's Rights Monitoring and Evaluation Board, what is the legal capacity for this board? And how is the principle of the convention integrated? Does it have a budget? Is there a body to evaluate the implementation of the strategy? On the issue of allocation of resources, although the public expenditure for children has been increasing in the health and education sector, however, the spending is not high on international standards and the committee notes the lack of major social support for families and youth services. Is there a monitoring system for public expenditure for children? And to what extent budgetary allocation in favor of children benefit the most vulnerable groups? On the issue of the National Plan of Action on Combating Human Trafficking, there are no direct reference to children how are children protected under such national plan of action? And is there a budget allocated? On the issue of data collection, significant gaps persist on national data system. Not all data available is segregated by ethnic or religious identity. Data on children is not always shared with the public. In the process of reporting on the situation of all children, is there cooperation between government agencies, civil societies, academic institution, think tanks to consolidate the available data? Is there policy-oriented surveys on specific group of children, children in poor areas, and data on child labor in line with internationally accepted indicators? On the issue of dissemination of the convention and training, what arrangements are made in the National Child's Rights Strategy and the related action plan for increasing awareness of child rights among citizens, parents, professionals, administrators, and leaders? With the issue of coordination, I would like to congratulate Your Excellency on the establishment of your Ministry of Family and Social Policies I would like to know, and the committee would like to know, how will it take role in the imp implementation of the Convention of the Rights of the Child? 
What is the coordination level between private and, vol and voluntary sector, local authority, and also different regions in the country? In early 2011, the Directorate General for Social Services and the Child Protection Agency declared the National Child's Rights Strategy for 2012 and 2016. What is the current official status of the National Rights of the National Child Rights Strategy? What institutional arrangements are being made to implement it and what financial and human resources are available? Finally, I would like to conclude with the freedom of expression, thought, conscious, and belief. The, regarding the freedom of expression and the right to be heard, there has been a mention in a report on a pilot project on child-oriented process. Can you clarify how the views of the child are actually brought into the decision-making process? And also, finally, can you confirm a case of a 14-year-old student who made a joke about Ataturk and was brought into court in 2009, resulting in a three year in a three years imprisonment. And can you please comment on that? Thank you. Thank you. I would now give the floor to the other members of the committee. Madam Sandberg, you have the floor. Thank you. I have a question on the cooperation with civil society. Uh, Your, Excellency, Your Excellency mentioned in your opening speech uh, that you need a strong civil society to support the process of strengthening uh, children's rights, uh, which, is, which we welcome. Uh, but we have some information that um, the, your work with the NGOs working for or with children and with children themselves remains uh, arbitrary, so we would like to know what kind of mechanisms do you have in order to involve NGOs and children th themselves in the reporting process to the committee and also in the implementation of the children's rights? Because the committee is also very much dependent on the civil society in the implementation and the reporting process when it comes to children's rights. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Pollard, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join my colleagues in welcoming the delegation. I have two issues to raise. One on name and nationality. Uh, this right is enshrined in the convention. Yes, the government of Turkey has done so much in this area, so in, the, in this area, especially in birth registration. Example, the percentage of children under five whose births have not yet been registered fell from 16% to 6%. This is very commendable. However, I have a few f issues to raise here. Now, what measures have been taken by the Department for Population and Nationality Affairs to identify and address obstacles to timely and accurate birth registration, particularly in rural and eastern regions among children in uneducated parents. I believe this issue is what has hampered the total reduction. Instead of stopping at 6%, possibly it would have come to 0 or 2%. So what is the method being used to address this? The other issue is the protection of privacy of the child. And this is enshrined in Article 16 of the Convention. Now, the State Party report is silent on the measures taken to ensure compliance on this, art on this article. And also the State Party does not even refer to the past report because issues which are not contained in the current report in some provisions are referred to the first report. But this particular Article 16 is not. Now, in the absence, therefore, of this information, I pose the following questions. One is, how is a child's privacy in all settings within the family, within the family alternative, it will mean within the family, alternative care, and other institutions care to afford. The other issue is how is a child's family and home protected from arbitrary and unlawful interference? And further on this, how is a child's privacy of communication with others protected 
say let us still in the same domain does a child have a right to confidential advice and counseling and finally on this what control is there on information stored in records or files about a child thank you Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Parle. Mr. Guran, you have the floor, sir. Monsieur Guran. Thank you. My warm welcome to the Turkish delegation. I have uh, one question. I would like to follow my, uh, my uh, colleagues before about the chat participation about the guarantee in your country of the child participation to deciding about the issue connecting the, the child. First of all, I, I would like to know some more information about the school parliaments, about the child-friendly cities, as you mentioned in your report, and uh, first of all, I would like to know some more information in the independent uh, monitoring mechanism in your country. If you can provide us with more information about the complaints, about the, some uh, results in, in this area. And I would like to know uh, maybe as you mentioned that you have some school parliaments if you can provide us with the information about the regional differences, it's really covered uh, all schools with uh, this issue of the child parliament. And that, uh, my question is, if really all children have access to complain, and uh, what, wh what is the state policy in this area? Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Gouin, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Gran. Mr. Contrafan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and welcome the delegation from Turkey. And I really am really appreciate for your eagerness to have a dialogue with the committee. I have some question concerning with the legislation uh, from the state parties. Report paragraph 10 F mentions that the law on child protection 2005 is combined, compliant with the convention and from the report paragraph 89 has confirmed that the provision to support the children care takers in order to ensure the prevention, detection, reporting, and so on. Uh, the state party report, paragraph 1990, state that the law on establishment of the agency has entrusted the agency with the task to establishing and examining families, children, and so on. These legal instruments work in collaboration with the Turkish penal code, which is punitive legal measures. I would like to know in your legal system, are there any cumulative or less tolerative legal measures which can make the child victims grow up in the family environment in, at, in atmos atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding as stated in the preamble of the convention? In case of domestic violence, and there is a child living in the family, how can the law on child protection 2005 intervene with the family? And who shall have authority to set up rules and safety measures for the child and the victim? In case of domestic violence, which the mother has to divorce from the father, is there any provisions give the opportunity, opportunity to the child to express the views on his or her guardians or not. And last question from the state party's report, paragraph 89, mentions that the Turkish penal court has provided for sanctions against those who do not report cases of persons in need or incapacitated to look after themselves. 
as well as against those civil servants and health officials who do not report crimes, they gain knowledge of doing the conduct of their duties. How can the state party monitor whether they fail to report or not? And is there any forensic scientist, pediatrician, psychologist, or social worker to examine the mandatory report or not? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Mr. Madi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to join my colleagues in extending a warm welcome to the delegation, or rather the strong delegation of, of, of Turkey. Um, that shows the interest of the country to have a dialogue with our committee. I would like to focus on the issue of honor killing and forced suicide. As I'm coming from the same region, the Middle East, I know that this heinous custom and related crimes are rooted in some uneducated, ignorant communities in some rural areas around the region and maybe beyond. And this crime has to be fought by all means, government, NGOs, and media should exert efforts in fighting this crime and overriding such ignorant customs. First, we welcome all efforts being done to combat this custom. In terms of legislation and awareness campaign and training programs, which resulted in reducing the number of victims of these crimes. Yet the last available official report of 2008 showed that 1,100 cases of ethic and honor killings took place between 2003 and 2007. Out of these, 9% involved children. Moreover, some alarming reports indicate that women and girls under threat of honor killings when took refuge with public authorities could not be protected or are returned to their families. And shelters for victims of violence or potential victims are not available in many cities. Now, did the government compile any data about the number of cases of honor killings since 2008 and how many cases reached courts in general? Are there any data on the number of shelters for victims of these crimes and how they are distributed in different provinces? And how many potential children victims making use of them what kind of training provided to members of police force and those working in shelters <laughs> in order to prevent any lack of protection to victims? And if the police hotline 155 and the Bar Association of Ankara Helpline, triple four, are working uh, nationwide, and is there any data on the number of children victims used these lines and how the operators of those lines react in cases of imminent danger to potential victims. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now give the floor to Mr. Cardona. Thank you, Chair. I would join my colleagues in, in welcoming the, the delegation of Turkey and my question relates to an issue that I think is, is very concrete and 
is applicable to the entire convention, and that is the interest of the child. This has been incorporated into Article 4 of the Law on the Protection of the Child and in the 2010 Constitution. Uh, an express provision has been included to that effect, but there is an exception to the right of the child to live with his or her parents. In your report, in the report, the Turkish delegation states that following the European Union adopt the adoption of the European Union Convention on the Rights of the Child, that the su Supreme Court would would annul some of those rights. How do you? What is your opinion of this? Could you perhaps? Give me, give us, give the committee an, a concrete example. In referring to the interests of the child as being an e exception and their exception to them living with their parents, you have mentioned that there are 109 sentences that have been given, be it for. Um, uh, physical or intellectual incapacity of the parents, the judges have ruled that that the child should not live with his or her parents because this would have a harmful effect on their well-being and their general interests. So let's uh, look at the example of two families in which though perhaps the parents have a very slight mental disability. And perhaps an indication has been given in this case that the child should have another legal guardian. Can the judge indicate that in the interest of the child that the child should not uh, no longer live with his or her parents? Let's say one judge says that and another judge says that in the best interest of the child, the child should continue to live with his or her parents. So I would like to know do both of those rulings take into account the best interests of the child? Is it at the intent of, do, does the su Supreme Court issue such rulings? Are there guidelines that are used or provisions in the law to know whether or not the best interests of the child are being taken in, into account? Thank you. Merci, Madame. Thank you. Madame Edu, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to also welcome very warmly the Honorable Minister and the very large and impressive delegation from Turkey. We thank her for her statement, uh, which has, as you have said, Mr. Chairman, uh, 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 provided us with the positive efforts that have been made in the last decade, as well as the challenges. I'd just like to ask a question about one issue, and is the knowledge of the convention and the dissemination of the convention as well as training of all who are concerned with uh, children's rights. Um, the report, the State Party report, is very rich in the, the details that it gives us uh, on um, various activities, initiatives, and training um, uh, activities, uh, including campaigns and so on, uh, that have been undertaken by various sectors including the police, the justice, education, health, social welfare, and so on. My question is, do you think that today in Turkey you have a strong culture of child rights in the society at large, not merely in, among the professionals? In other words, parents, groups of uh, people in minority communities, uh, in less advantaged communities, and so on, do all of these people have the information, the knowledge, the awareness of child rights and particularly the convention? And are the principles of the convention really being applied uh, in the work of the professionals that are being so trained? And how do you assess that? Have you made evaluations of this? Does the National Child Rights Strategy and Action Plan, which you have, have provisions for um, uh, uh, raising awareness on child rights based on the convention? 
awareness among all the citizens, uh, including opinion leaders and policy makers. Um, with respect to education, have you integrated child rights education in the school curriculum from primary to the higher levels? Have you or could the Ministry of National Education and Higher Education Council uh, consider making instruction, full instruction in child rights based on the convention compulsory in the training of teachers before they go into service and not you, uh, do it after, as a uh, um, short-term in-service training activities? because a lot of multiplier effects can be gained if the teachers are well grounded in the uh, 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 child rights as they work with children. Uh, the same would also uh, uh, happen if such compulsory uh, training, and I'm asking it as a question, do you have child rights based on the convention as a, as a compulsory part of the training of the key officials and professionals who work with children, such as the social welfare uh, um, professionals, the justice professionals, and even the police. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to join all of the colleagues in warmly welcoming the delegation, thanking them for the very detailed report on progress in public policy in your country. First of all, I would congratulate you on the progress made, and I would say that I hope that this meeting will help you to continue to make greater achievements in achieving children's rights. I will touch on something that my colleagues have already raised, and that is violence. It's difficult to understand the degree of violence on children. Violence is whenever their rights are not considered, when we do not consider a child as a person with rights, and which is when it's not in line with the development of the society at large. Now, you say that you have had a campaign 2007 to 2010 to, vi to combat violence. Have you assessed the plan? What results did it produce? What were the consequences? You also tell us that there is a law, 4320, which is family protection. And then finally, in her statement this morning, the minister tells us that there is a law adopted on the 8th of May. I don't know if it's already come into force or where that stands. And my question is whether within that law there has been explicit inclusion of all forms of violence against children, as you see in the 2006 report on violence. Has it does the law specifically prohibit physical violence or any type of violence, as was just raised with regard whether you could take sacrifice, um, suicide as constituting a traditional or a custom? And then what mechanisms do children have to make complaints? And as Mrs. Adu has said, in what way have we made information available to children so that they know at what point they can complain and what things they should file complaints about? Third, how do they do this? And fourth, the shelters, not just for honor violence, but any type of family violence in your country. How is that dealt with? Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Alasmar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I echo my voice to my colleague and warmly welcome the Turkish delegation. And thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the informative opening statement. My first question is about uh, uh, if you address yet the rights of minority group in your legislation. 
My second question, it's about the early, uh, the, the age of marriage. It's 17. But what if this happened before 17 years old? Uh, is this affecting uh, uh, birth registration or uh, the standard of living for the family who get married before this age? Uh, and um, my other question, it's from your opening statement. You mentioned that you usually transfer uh, the, the pregnant woman from rural uh, area to, to a very close city to get safe delivery. But this is very discriminatory service. Don't you believe that uh, the mother needs to be uh, between uh, her other members of family, especially when she has another uh, children at home? Um, why you don't uh, well qualified the midwives in the rural? Can you please give us an idea about this? And my last question, it's about reintegrating and rehabilitation children when they are in, like what you said, house of love or something like this. Are you uh, building the new reforming according to the res to new research or you are copying uh, successful stories from another nation that's similar to Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Vijmani? Let me uh, join uh, my other colleagues in uh, extending a warm welcome uh, to the delegation from Turkey. Uh, I just want to make some very brief comments about uh, your data collection, which uh, I think one of my colleagues also mentioned. Uh, I would like to know uh, what plans you have to centralize data collection related to children, and will you uh, be considering the convention as the basis for the data collection? And at present, is your data collection system covering children? who are vulnerable to abuse and exploitation, children who belong to minority groups, children in conflict with the law, uh, children who are asylum seekers, adopted children, children in institutions, and children in child labor. Thank you. Madam Moras. <laughs> Mrs. Moras, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Yes, I too would like to join those who have warmly welcomed the minister and the delegation for coming, for providing additional responses to the very complete information that you had already sent us. <clears throat> I have three points that I would very quickly like to touch upon. First of all, just by way of adding to what my colleagues have said with regard to the issue of violence, especially corporal punishment. Corporal punishment is something that this committee raised in 2001 with Turkey, especially with, in view of the fact that corporal punishment has not been explicitly prohibited within the family context. And also with regard to the fact that there is a provision that forbids corporal punishment in the schools, the implementation of these provisions appears not to be particularly successful or not universal, not universally applied. So the result is leaves a lot to be desired. Perhaps it might be useful to ask the delegation of Turkey perhaps to comment on the fact that there are so many provisions that you have described to try to support women, children, and those <coughs> sectors of the population where there is violence. But what are you actually doing to prevent violence, to achieve that cultural change, which requires collectively as a society to do away with this discrimination, this violence against women, which is discrimination. So I would like to know what you think of it, what is necessary for that cultural change to come about. The second point has to do with regional disparities. Some of my colleagues have already raised the general social policy framework in your 
replies to the list of issues, you do provide very detailed information. And I would specifically like to ask, or perhaps point out, since I'm from Latin America, which is where these tied money transfers and where there has been a lot of evaluation and assessment. What we're seeing in Latin America is that these programs have been useful in achieving some specific short-term objectives. For example, increasing the number of children registered at school or that pregnant women actually turn up for prenatal checks. They are, however, short-term and they do not replace a general social framework. So my question has to do with what is that social policy, that comprehensive policy which over the long term will eliminate these regional disparities which continue. Some of them are regional disparities between different regions, but they're also disparities which are in fact inspired or motivated by other reasons such as ethnic groups. So the investment, social investment, according to the information from the OECD and from the World Bank, in social aspects, social work, social services, education and health, is lower than the European Union average. And so I wonder if you could comment on this for us. And finally, just to add to what was said by my colleague, the rapporteur, Mr. Cotran, with regard to the private sector, the impact of the private sector and companies on the rights of the child has been brought into greater focus internationally within, for example, the Human Rights Council and in the different committees, Mr. Kotrani mentioned the specific concern of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights with regard to a specific case, which is the Ilisu Dam and other dams with regard to forced displacement into areas of Istanbul, and I'm not trying to repeat what Mr. Kotran said, I would just like to point out, or rather ask, whether the Turkish state is considering laws and regulations that would specifically prevent or punish the violation of human rights, in particular those of children, by the private sector, be it 100% private or by state companies sometimes because these can in fact be state companies that are regulating in this area. And I'm not talking here about social corporate liability and what we're really talking about is the state's ability to regulate the behavior of private companies. Mr. Gasto, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, sir. First of all, good morning and welcome to the delegation of Turkey. I would briefly like to come back to an issue that was already raised by some of my colleagues, that is the familiarity, awareness of the convention since it is a part of the Turkish legislation. Is it a background also for administrative decisions as well as judicial decisions? For example, in reforming or changing first level court decisions, is there a control over whether or not national laws are in line with international standards. Ms. Zameli. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. I'd like to also join my voice in welcoming the large delegation from 
Turkey. I enjoyed reading your uh, State Party report and your written replies, uh, but I was faced with a question. Uh, you re your report was submitted in 2009. However, it only covers up to the period of 2006, and I'm wondering uh, if there was a, a confusion or a misunderstanding. It. I would like for you to clarify that for us. I have questions on two areas, access to information and freedom of association. Uh, you still manage to uh, maintain Article 17 reservation, as our, co uh, as our co rapporteur indicated in his uh, opening. But I would like to draw your attention to that particular Article Number 17 of our Convention D, uh, excuse me, uh, C, which encouraged the production and dissemination of children's books. If you have a reservation on an article which contains something about production and dissemination of children's books, and your State Party report, p paragraph 53 says, you have many libraries. I'm wondering uh, what kind of information will be in these libraries when you have a reservation on children's books. Uh, I'd like to go to freedom of association. I, I welcome the law of uh, association the, uh, that you uh, enacted. But I, I th I'm a little confused in your State Party report, paragraph 45. You say children, those above 15 may establish or join associations with written permission from parents. And then you go on to say children above 12 may join with written permission. So I, what, what is it? Which age can children join even with per, or written permission? Because at one part of the paragraph you say above 15 and the other you say uh, only above 12. So I'm confused there. Now in, in relation to establishing association, how easy is it for somebody? Because we have reports that, although you say the law of association makes it uh, possible, uh, there's a lot of red tape in bureaucracy, and it's really not that easy. Uh, I have one uh, a small question on our previous concluding observation, which was actually in 2000. Maybe this is my misunderstanding, and I need uh, you to uh, help me better understand. Your civil code was uh, amended. Now, was this particular part that addresses that children should not be entitled to exercise civil rights, has that changed after the amendment of your civil code? Because if not, then we are, I'm very puzzled here. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, ceci conclu. Thank you very much. With this, I believe we've now concluded our first round of questions, and there are many questions. Some of them simply uh, complement things that have been said. Others uh, bring up new issues. So we'll take a break, and so you can group your replies. Don't re respond to the members individually, but you can cluster the groups. So we'll take a break until 11.35, and that's Swiss time, please, because that would barely give you an hour to respond, and then from 12.35 on, we'll do the questions for the second cluster. So we'll break until 11.35.